the, um, one of the, the best weekends, uh, we, we lived overseas for 15 years and landed back in the U.S. in 2004 with uh, three teenage daughters who'd never lived in, in the U.S. Um, our, our first schooling decision was preschool in Peshawar, Pakistan with Janika, and the decision was, does she go to school in a horse-drawn tonga, does she go to school in little bicycle rickshaw, or does she go to school in the car? Um, she then studied, it was uh, with us in Kenya and uh, Geneva. When we arrived to Geneva, she was eight and it was her third country. So although she's as far from international health today in Winona, Minnesota, she's, she's had the experience. But it is, it, um, I come as a sort of a Christian leader of a secular organization. And, and this, I was kind of, this is the sixth year. And I have to say, it's wonderful to see CCIH having gone from strength to strength. I think Ray has done an amazing job kind of bringing together a team and, and building it. The conference um, uh, has gotten more and more professional. The website, the, even the abstract form communicates is something that and has evolved over time. And um, the, uh, the, the website, is, as I mentioned, is, is just great. Uh, we've also changed venues. When, We've also changed venues, sorry. When we started, we were, those of you that remember, it was really hot, no air conditioning in, in Buckystan, Maryland, and then we moved from there, and now at, at this venue. The one thing I've observed have, hasn't changed is the size of the sheets, um, which still don't quite fit the beds. <laughs> but, but I think that's kind of nice. Um, the, the topic today, I always get excited when, when um, Henry Mosley and, and let me just say, aside from, from, from Ray, um, Mona, uh, Nancy, the, the, the whole team that, that puts this together, uh, the board of directors, all of the people who really make it happen, I, I just think it's, it, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, so when I get <laughs> an email from, from Laura uh, and, and Henry and say, could you think about this, um, I never know what sort of an exploration it, it'll take, take us on. And let me just declare two conflicts of interest. The first conflict of interest is that um, I, I turned 60 this last year, and so I'm thinking more about longevity, and I have a bias to see some positive <laughs> results. The other is um, I have to, uh, to, um, to uh, mention a bias in terms of, of, of faith. And, um, oh, really, it's not, they're not getting it in the back? Or? Oh, oh, fine, okay. Um, can you hear this one too? Not as well. Okay, um, but a, a little bit of a bias of faith. I grew up uh, Presbyterian, went through communicants, all of that, um, and went to church off and on. And in 1999, I was working at the World Health Organization, had two jobs, literally two jobs at two offices. Neither one of them was easy. Um, and went into a total cave of work, lost touch with the family. Um, they actually asked me to leave, and <laughs> that Janica and her three sisters and her mother. I refused to go, and my wife said to me, you need to learn how to give it up to God. Well, you know, I, so um, she said, you got to see Jim, the pastor, and I saw Jim, and Jim, uh, our pastor, starts with this little, you've seen the diagram about faith and the bridge and all that, and he says, he starts talking about faith, and I said, Jim, I don't want to know about faith. I just want to know how to give it up to God, and he goes, oh. What I realized is for 50 years, I'd been going through life thinking I was a Christian, and I actually, when I didn't know how to pray, I didn't know how to read the Bible, and come to think about it, I wasn't really convinced. And I went through a three-year journey of reading and became completely convinced, and so that's, that's the other bias. And one of the things that I realized was that there's this disconnect, and I saw it at the first CCIH conference, was that we have the worship time, and then we have the global health time. And I first um, really came face to face with that when we had some difficult things at, at, at MSH, and I tried to see how to apply faith. So um, I went on this journey through the Bible and learned a bit about God's first century leadership team. Great lessons. And then, the te then the, uh, as Laura mentioned, the topic was technology. And, and then the topic was uh, uh, MDGs, and when, they, when Laura and Henry said, can you do something on this, it was an absolutely stunning and shocking uh, journey into the data and the evidence 
um, which many of you see and feel, but it's just absolutely stunning when you look at the, the impact of the tenacious injustices. And um, that led me ultimately to, <laughs> to resign membership in the church that I was in because it turned out they didn't let women be elders. So today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about chronic diseases, and, and I know you talked a lot yesterday, just a little bit stepping back at the size of the epidemic. We're then going to go into the word and just remind ourselves what God has to say about healthy living. I mean, going back to um, the, the, the words of, of Moses and the prophets, and Jesus' two-thirds of his miracles were healings. Uh, and then some of Paul's admonitions. And then finally, what's the evidence? And this was amazing to me, is how much scientific evidence is accumulating. Let's, let me take us to Lake Malawi, properly speaking, Lake Nyanza. This is Lucy Sakala. Lucy is, uh, a, was an AIDS counselor. She worked with us in uh, Salima Hospital. Three years ago, she was diagnosed with uterine cancer. She was lucky enough between some insurance coverage and friends to get uh, chemotherapy and surgery. And Lucy relates a story of talking with AIDS patients. She talks about how she talks to AIDS patients when she has to counsel them on a positive test. And she goes, you need to live positively. I do. There's some things worse than AIDS, like cancer. And as she's telling that story, she's thinking of the seven-hour drive it took to get to uh, the uh, nearest town with treatment and back. And actually, a couple years later, she would be thinking that she needs radio, uh, radiation therapy, but she can't go to Zambia for that. She needs a particular kind of combination chemotherapy. She can't get to South Africa for that. And it is a cruel paradox that the um, people taking care of AIDS patients for whom we've done so much over the last decade are themselves suffering and dying from conditions which have been long treatable in the North and which are, in many cases, preventable. So um, just, it, it, it's an epid medicine and pa public health is funny. The epidemic's been growing, but it's just caught up with this. This is a slide, 2008, high-income countries, middle-income, lower-middle-income, low-income countries. The green is chronic NCDs, the f big four and, and a few others. These are numbers of deaths, 7.9 million deaths. In lower-middle-income countries, 19 million deaths already in 2008 from chronic non-communicable diseases. This part is what I would call the traditional global health diseases. <laughs> Uh, AIDS, TB, malaria, maternal cause, um, um, NMNCH, <laughs> newborn maternal uh, child health problems. It's only in lower income countries, the, 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 um, the yeah, lower income countries, where actually you have um, the, the deaths uh, greater for AIDS. And th by the way, the reason why this is so big is because it's got, it, in this ranking, it's got India and China in it. You may be wondering <laughs> why, why the, uh, um, so 28 million deaths in low and middle income countries from chronic NCDs among children, youth, and working age adults. Children, youth, and working age adults. Preventable deaths, 8 million a year. That's more than, a than total deaths, AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. And, um, so, although there are lots of lessons to learn from AIDS, TB, and malaria, we have to take a very different view on uh, how to attack the NCD epidemic. Huge rich uh, divide between the rich and the poor countries. Deaths among women from just two cancers, cervical and breast cancer. There are as many deaths in low and middle income countries as pregnancy and childbirth. A bit more in the older ages, but almost as many in the reproductive years. But by listening to the rhetoric, listening to the <laughs> public health messaging, and, list and looking at health systems, you could be forgiven for thinking that poor women don't get cancer. I mean, that, that's, 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 that's a reality. A man with prostate cancer, a woman with cervical cancer, diagnosed in a low-income country, has three times the chance of dying, same stage of disease as in high-income countries. Young diabetic, 
in Maputo, in Mozambique, in the capital, diagnosed at age 15, who needs insulin, has at least another 20 years. 800 miles north, they ha where insulin's not available, they have six to 18 months. Remind you of, some <laughs> remind you of AIDS a decade ago? Um, smoking will kill a billion people this century. We have now managed to move the majority of smokers from the north to the south, so 80% are in low-income countries. Uh, Africa, it just in half a dozen countries where there's data, obesity doubles when you move to the city. Huge cost, and actually the price, less than $2 per person per year for Best Buy uh, prevention for countries like China and, and India. So um, this is 2004, that's 2030. So if we keep going how we're going, best guess is we're gonna double the NCDs and we're gonna cut in half the uh, both categories of the sort of traditional uh, uh, global health diseases, not quite as much in maternal. And then we're gonna have more roads so we'll kill more people on the road so we'll have a different topic five years from now, 10 years from now. So, okay, so there's a, what, what do we do? There's a huge web of risk factors. In some ways, it's, it's, it's AIDS was a multi-sectoral disease, not NCDs are even more multi-sectoral. There's some basic characteristics which we can't, with some of which we can change, some of which, I mean, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't be 40 again, um, and I can't be a woman. Well, these days I could, but, um, <laughs> but <laughs> Um, uh, and, you know, stress, smoking, all of these factors and then the, the result from that. So the question is, is there a role for religion, for faith, in, in tempering this whole sequence of cause and effect for the major killers? And I will look for biblical wisdom to Janica.